Hello lovelies, in this video we're going to be looking at the provision of abiotic and biotic factors in habitat management and this is for your AQA, A level environmental science. Now this is a really really important one and it links through to A level biology as well if you're doing that. So please make sure you know the between biotic and abiotic factors really really carefully. level environmental science. Topic 1. The living environment. Lesson 12. Provision of abiotic and biotic factors in habitat management. We are now going to explore the decisions that need to be made when managing or creating a habitat to conserve the species that live there. In order to protect a species properly, you need to have a detailed understanding of the biotic and abiotic factors that they will need in order to survive and ensure that they are provided as part of the habitat conservation. Hopefully you remember from previous videos that abiotic factors are non-living components of an ecosystem, such as light, whereas biotic factors are the living components. Make sure those two terms are in your glossary. We are going to talk through a list of both abiotic and biotic factors, and for each one, talk about why it would be needed for survival and how we can ensure it has been provided in the habitat. Abiotic factors needed for survival and how we could ensure they are provided for in the habitat. Light is essential for plant species who require UV rays from the sun in order to complete photosynthesis, which produces sugars. Some animal species may rely on light in order to see prey species or recognise potential mates. The location of the habitat will be essential in ensuring that they get enough sunlight. For example, the poles receive much less than the equator. Furthermore, features such as tree cover can help provide shade for those that need it. For submerged aquatic plants, it is important that the water remains clear to allow light to continue penetrating the surface, so it must be protected from pollutants. Having buffer strips around the water is a good method we can use. This is a strip of land between the water and a farm that is not cultivated so reduces the chance of fertilisers running off into the water and causing eutrophication. pH. The pH levels of soil and water in an area should be as close to the optimum of the species you are trying to protect, which for a lot of species will be around 7. If the pH changes dramatically away from the optimum, then it could lead to enzymes denaturing, which stops metabolic processes from continuing and can be fatal. There are a range of gases that when mixed with water form an acid such as carbon dioxide. Furthermore, mines can release toxic acid mine drainage. pH of both water and soil bodies would need to be monitored regularly to ensure they were within the optimum, especially for species with a very narrow range of tolerance. Ensuring there are few polluting activities happening close to the habitat, such as power stations or mining, should help reduce the risk of this happening. It is important to note, however, that some plant species have optimum pHs that are further from neutral, and this can be controlled by the type of soil they are grown in. Those plants that require more alkaline soils will do best in soils on top of bedrock formed from chalk or limestone, for example. Water availability. Water is an essential part of any habitat. It plays lots of roles to all the organisms found there. In the most simple sense, it is important that any habitat has a plentiful supply of water, whether that be a water body like a lake or high precipitation rates and lots of water in the soil. If a species requires water for drinking, then it would be important to ensure there was a water body there that they could use. If the species were completely aquatic, then you need to ensure the size of the water body is large enough to accommodate the whole population. For some organisms, the water body may provide a food source, so again, features such as size and depth, for example, would need to be right for the prey species found there too. Sometimes, when talking about marine species, then water is the entire habitat, so in these cases, water availability isn't much of an issue. It would be more important to look at water quality, such as pH and dissolved oxygen levels and salinity. Nutrients. Nutrients such as nitrates, phosphates and carbon are required by all living organisms to build biological molecules such as proteins and DNA. To illustrate the importance of this abiotic factor, 
we are going to look at plants. If designing a habitat for plant species, then it is important to look at soil fertility, as this will be the main provider of nutrients. If the soil has quite a low fertility, then it may not be able to support a large population of plants. Nutrients may need to be added artificially through fertilisers or by planting leguminous crops that fix nitrogen. However, it is also important to remember that too many nutrients can also be a bad thing. When inorganic fertilisers are used on farmland, they often end up running off and leaching into water bodies causing eutrophication, which reduces the dissolved oxygen content of the water. A risk assessment would need to be carried out to ensure that this would not happen, as it would kill any aerobic species in the water. Finally, we are going to talk about the need for abiotic habitat provision. This means any abiotic feature such as rock, soil or sand, which will be required as a habitat, nesting site or feeding ground for the organisms being protected. Again, this will depend on the species being conserved, but also the size of the population in the habitat. You would need to ensure there was enough space for all individuals, so intraspecific competition is kept quite low. We don't want them competing with each other and some dying if it is an endangered species. A good example of this is seabirds requiring cliff space to build their nests. Biotic factors needed for survival and how we could ensure they are provided for in the habitat. Food availability. In order to release an organism into a habitat, it has to have the right food species available, whether it is a herbivore, carnivore or omnivore. Not only should the food species be present, but also in a suitable abundance for the size of the population. If the habitat is lacking in a food source, then it may need to be supplied by humans intermittently. For example, if the animal you are protecting is a herbivore, then we would need to ensure that the plant species it prefers are available. This becomes more difficult for those species that are extremely specific about what food they will eat and much easier for those that will eat a variety. A case study of very picky eaters is the giant panda who will only eat bamboo. Another biotic factor that needs to be considered during habitat management and creation is the threat of predation. If an organism is being heavily predated as the predator population is too large, then the decision may need to be taken to cull some of the predator population or move them elsewhere. These decisions would not be made lightly and may require special permits. Another option that may be possible is moving members of the population you are trying to conserve to a new habitat where the predation threat is less prevalent or providing them with a protection when first reintroduced to prevent over-predation. These decisions will need to be well thought out as we want to conserve all biodiversity so the deaths of a predator species due to loss of food would not be a good solution. Pollination and seed dispersal are essential processes for plants that are carried out by other species. We describe them as interspecies relationships. For a conservationist trying to manage or create a habitat for a plant species, they need to be researching which other species are found there and whether a successful interspecies relationship could be established. Insects such as bees and wasps are key players when it comes to pollination. Lots of different organisms can act as seed dispersers, either by eating the seeds and dispersing them in their faeces, or the seeds can become attached to them, for example trapped in their fur, and be transported that way. Without these two processes, plant populations will not be able to establish. This is easier to ensure for some species who can be pollinated or have seeds dispersed by a range of species. However, there are some plants that require the presence of a particular species during pollination. One example is the Darwin's orchid, which requires a certain type of moth with an extremely long proboscis to reach its nectar. Living organisms can also provide a habitat to other species, such as trees, where lots of species build nests. As a conservationist, ensuring you know enough about the organism's breeding requirements will help to ensure they have the correct biotic habitat provision available. Other species may live in the nests or burrows of others. Some even live attached to the other species. In all of these examples, it would be important to ensure that species were available to form these relationships to ensure survival. We have seen that there are lots of considerations that go into managing or creating a habitat 
for a protected species. A lot of data collection and planning would need to be completed to ensure the habitat is as suitable as possible. Organisms that have less specific requirements are much easier to accommodate during this process. Some species are so specific in their requirements that this process would almost be impossible to do if we had to make a new habitat after theirs is destroyed. Think about coral reefs, for example. They have multiple specific requirements, such as the warm, stable temperatures, the perfect salinity, and high light intensity. As a result, the location in which we could try and build an artificial reef for them to grow on would be very limited. This is why we need to try and protect all existing habitats as much as possible. Ouch! This is why in some videos I like explain scratches.